Hmm, I'm bored. Let's read a book. <laughs> the drawing was simple enough, a wooden armchair, with the five spokes supporting a simple contoured back. Dorman stools, as old as some of them were, were more than adequate for the job. And in adapting an old Marian design in the faded book, I thought Bostrick and I could deliver the armchairs for less than Jarrell. The dining set would have meant bidding against Perlip. We can do it, I said quietly. The glint of gold from the back of the shot told me that Deirdre was watching from the darkness pulled at the bottom of the stairs that led up to the family living quarters. I almost sighed. For eight golds or less, asked the crafter. He still had on the ratty sweater, and the rear window was open but a trace. I wiped my forehead before answering. With what I have in the stable, plus the logs, say four golds. Five or six days' work over two weeks. We bid ten. If you can do it, then I'll mark the bid. Destron said slowly. His color remained grayish, despite all I had done. I didn't like doing work for someone like a sub-prefect, especially in Gallus. But steady as the income from the benches was, and despite Brettel's commissions and the work from Wessel and Ryson, there wouldn't be enough coin to meet the quarterly tax levies. That left only a few choices, like indenturing Deirdre to one of the local gentry, or a work indenture from Destro himself. Not a personal indenture, but that of all his output to the prefect or a local merchant. Destrin couldn't meet the terms of an indenture, and the default would leave Deirdre penniless. As for indenturing Deirdre, I shivered at that. Since the bits were publicly opened, Gerald couldn't use whatever influence he might have to change the award. Even as we were successful, that only bought Destrin and Bostrick time, perhaps a year unless the levy were reduced. The shop would have to close, but in a year a great deal could happen. As for me, a lot of questions about the prefect still remained unanswered. How could a ruler who opposed local corruption so fiercely be so close to Antonin and his lady Sapphire, who appeared to be nearly as adept as the white wizard himself? You sure we can do this? Bostrick asked yet again, sawdust stuck to his forehead, glued in pace by his sweat. For once there was no mock respect, no banter, and that told me even he was worried. I sighed. Doing the work was getting to be the least of my concerns. Would anyone else like some cold red berry? interrupted Deer Deer. Alice had left a little ice left over. I nodded, wiping my forehead again. I'll take mine without ice, Destron whined. Ice, please, Bostrick added. I need to cool off even more now. Both Deer Dare and I ignored his added comment. Destron hadn't heard it. Deer Dare served me first, and I drained nearly all of it in one gulp. Trying to cool off from too much warmth in the shop, Destrum was always cold. And while I could take the cold, adapting to too much heat was far harder. Finally, I wiped my forehead again. I'm taking a walk. Neither Destrum nor Bostrick said a word. Will you be back by midday for dinner? Asked Deirdre from the stairs. Probably. I just need some fresh air and to think a while. She nodded and was gone her feet barely whispering up the steps. After leaving the leather apron in my alcove and pulling on one of my two plain shirts, I stepped out onto the street. Left or right, to the left lay the square, I turned to the right. Taking a deep breath of the cooler outside air, 
avoiding a puddle that still remained from the rain of the night before. The evening showers hadn't been as bad as the ice and rainstorm several days earlier, but for the past eight day, late spring fogs had clouded the streets in the early morning right after dawn. Just as winter had been late in leaving, so too spring had lingered. Click, click. My boots rang on the stones as I ambled down the street of jewelers and around the corner to the wider street where the healers practiced. Not all my time was spent in the shop, nor in cleaning the stable, nor riding Gerlock, nor obtaining the woods from Bedel for our work. Besides my slow night studies of order, and my cautious attempts at applying them in small and hidden ways, like creating stronger glues by working with the internal order from the, one of the broths. I also wandered through the streets of Fenard, just somehow trying to understand why it felt the way it did. According to the book, feelings precede understanding. I hoped the understanding didn't lag too much, because I definitely having worried feelings, particularly after seeing Anton and Sephia entering the prefect's palace. Even recalling her gave me a chill, more so than seeing Antonin, or feeling him brush me aside, or walking down the healer's lane, each healer at a different sign. Rent through disease casting, that one was in white letters upon a red background, over a doorway that radiated, to my senses, a dull white red. I forced my feet not to cross to the other side of the pavement. Clickety-clack, clickety. A black horse pulled an equally black carriage away from an awning-covered doorway further up the street, heading away from me. Healing. The letters were etched into white oak and painted green. No aura surrounded that doorway, either simple physical medicine with herbs and the like, or a pretender, or both. Another doorway bore only the sign of a snake twisted around a staff. Why, I had no idea. A woman wearing a heavy cloak and broad-brimmed dark leather hat with the black veil glided from a doorway almost in front of me and back down the slanting pavement toward the street of jewelers. The odor of roses upon roses told me that she was even the sickness braid within her. That disorder that had so wrenched my guts when I had first sensed it, in such profusion when Bostrick had led me to the street of harlots, since I had noticed within a woman peddling combs in the square, and even a lady attached to one minister. Supposedly a high chaos master could remove the disease, but the price was reputed more than most women could pay. I shook my head and kept walking. Love filtries, love filtries. Hissed a voice from the shadows. Understandably enough, since the street peddling outside the square was forbidden. The woman's face was thin, scarred on both cheeks and pockmarked. The disorder within was worse, and I hastened my steps. Tentera, nature's healer. A guttered-out lamp, painted bright red, swung idly in the breeze beneath the sign. The doorway was banded in cold iron and barred. A tacit announcement that chaos barred from Tenteras, so of course was order. But who would know? Of filters. The words hissed up my spine even after I passed three more closed doorways and reached the black awning. The door underneath was black oak, banded in black iron, and bore no name nor any sign. I could feel nothing, either of chaos or order, and passed on to the far end of the jeweler's street where it curved around and led back toward the avenue. Even when you started in one direction in Fenard, you could end up going somewhere else. Did I want to pass by the palace gardens? I shrugged. Even my simple shirt felt clinging and warm as the sun struggled to break through the low clouds that had been 
fog at dawn. Two guards, one by each side of the gate, each bearing a halberd in addition to a short sword, watched as I walked towards them. If I looked to my right, I could see the green leaves of spring just barely blurring the outlines of the oak and maple branches extending above the stones of the wall. On the other side of the avenue were grand town homes of the ministers. You, what are you doing here? The nearer guard lowered the halberd slightly as if in threat. You're just taking your morning walk? Not for the likes of you, he growled. As I drew nearer, slowing and stopping, I could feel in the incredible sense of chaos that enveloped him. Yet beneath that disorder was a kernel of something else, as if the disorder had been dropped upon him, and he had been too weak to resist, but too strong to surrender totally. Without thinking, I reached out and strengthened his basic honesty and order, letting it push away the chaos as I stood there. You're right, I'll be going. As I left him standing there, I could sense the honest confusion as he tried to recover himself. Click, click. The sound of my heels on the polished stones of the street before the minister's houses echoed loudly in my ears. Who was that? whispered the second guard. Clink, clink. The sound of horses and mounted men rebounded from behind me, and I stepped as close to the side of the street as I could. Looking back over my shoulder, a troop of fresh cavalry rode in my direction. Standing aside the shadows that had begun to appear as the sun burned off the last of the morning fog, I watched. The standard bearer, younger than me, borne by a chestnut, passed with an impassive face and reek of chaos. A reek of disorder, only compounded by the armed men who followed. Clink, clickety, click, click, clink. As I leaned against the brick wall of the unknown house, I slowly gathered my near-shredded senses back into myself, marveling at the array of chaos energy, marveling and suppressing the urge to retch. Antonin Sephia must have been their work. Why, I didn't know, but Antonin's hands were on it as surely as though the city had designed the city as the way Uncle Sardit signed a chest with his maker's mark. With the horses safely passed, I eased my steps back toward Destrance. Had I been unwise in helping the guards struggle against unwanted chaos? Probably. Would I have done it again? Had there really been a choice? I tried not to shrug as the sun ducked behind another cloud and the shadows faded into gray again. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and turn on notifications so you never miss out on any of my videos. See you on the next one. Goodbye!